Welcome everybody to episode nine, On Top of the World, Canada and your supply chain with Pure Leader International. I'm your host, Justin Kramer, co-founder of ProShip, and with me today, I've got Jeff, Becky, and Rosemary. Jeff, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Justin. Uh, I'm Jeff Lukaszewski, Director of R&D at ProShip Software. Uh, a little bit about me, I've been in logistics for about 15 plus years. Um, I've been with ProShip for 10 and a half years. I started here in the professional services team working on new customer installs. And a few years ago, I moved into the R&D team. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. Becky, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, Becky Rosley, Corporate Executive Consumer for PureLater International. I've been with PureLater for nine years in the logistics transportation industry for 20 plus years. And my focus at PureLater International is working with retail consumer D2C shippers that are moving product into um, into Canada and working on developing new solutions, new products, and just continuing to find ways to help our customers grow and penetrate the Canadian market. And Rosemary, can we get you to introduce yourself? Yes, Rosemary Hill. I'm corporate manager for Korea Express, and I'm aligned with business to business segment with Pure Letter. I've been in logistics industry for over 25 years and a good 15 years with Pure Letter, uh, enabling a business into Canada and expanding our market share from US into Canada. Excellent, excellent. And because many of our listeners are US based, could Becky and Rosemary, could I get you guys to take a minute and actually introduce Pure Later to our listeners that are in the United States that may not be familiar with Pure Later? And uh, we'll go forward into how that can help them in Canada and things of that nature. But uh, let's go ahead and introduce Pure Later. Sure, I can take that. So Rosemary and I work for PureLater International. So we are a division of PureLater Courier in Canada. It was the largest courier network within Canada, been in business 60 plus years. We are part of the Canada Post group of companies. So Rosemary and I in the US, we work with customers generally based outside of the outside of Canada to facilitate movement of product into intra and out of Canada. We have 30 branches in the U.S. that are mainly there to consolidate and move northbound freight every night for our customers with the sole purpose of feeding the Canadian market. Excellent. So Canada is obviously a pretty pretty big market for, for those of us in the U.S. Let's start at a high level. Why is Canada such an attractive market for U.S. companies? I'll take that, Justin. Uh, Canada is very attractive for many reasons. One of them is because U.S. and Canada share very similar population characteristics. They have a large uh, middle class with a disposable income. And that means apparently Canadians spend much more per capita on online shopping than any other country in the world. The other big reason, Justin, is Canada is number one uh, U.S. trading partner. And this is largely because of the proximity that we have to Canada. Majority of the major metro areas are only about 90 minutes away from the border with the U.S. But lastly, uh, most U.S.-based companies have existing presence in Canada. So this happens to be just a natural extension of their best business into Canada, but also a natural area or, or segment to expand their business in North America. Sounds like if, if we're going to pick a country to start with shipping internationally, Canada is probably the best one for U.S. companies to start with. Let's talk about that because you, anytime we're shipping uh, across the border, there's there's a lot of things involved here. How can a carrier like PureLater assist with consolidated clearance from U.S. to Canada, whether it's LTL, small parcel? And for my listeners, consolidated clearance is where you pass a large number of shipments through the border as if they were one solid shipment, therefore paying one set of duties and or taxes dependent upon the country. Becky, let's start with you. Let's let's talk about how a carrier should assist as part of that, how they can make that a little bit easier. Sure. And Justin, you're correct. That tends to be one of the most intimidating factors when companies are looking to expand or grow into Canada is understanding the um, customs clearance process and determining what's the right fit for them. To that point, later we work with our customers and help guide them through that process of understanding their specific needs, the specific characteristics of their shipments, of the importer record requirements based upon what they need for their business, and determine what is the best 
solution for customs clearance. So we have a brokerage partner, Livingston International is our trade brokerage partner. They're the largest broker in Canada. And we work very closely with them to offer that solution extension of Purelater into a brokerage service for our customers. We also work with customers who use their own brokerage relationship. We're, we're, we're fine with that as well. But it's really key, again, of understanding the specific characteristic needs of that customer, whether they're going to do a consolidated clearance to a business for store replenishment, whether they want to clear everything as a um, CLVS clearance directly to the end consumer to, to take advantage of some of the tax benefits, which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later. But it's really understanding what their needs are. And then on the back end, it's enabling with our IT partners the ability to gather all that information for every package that's going to be moving that particular day for that customer and accumulating all of the relevant and needed customs information and providing that in one package to the broker and turn to, uh, to CBSA to allow for that consolidated clearance experience for each customer. And Rosemary, is there any difference between a business to business versus a business to consumer clearance in into Canada. Um, most of the clearance into Canada uh, for business to business, for the most part, it clears under under pass under consolidated pass, uh, not as individual uh, shipments. But what our business model does to U.S. companies, we give you a, a network that enables you to consolidate. Take, it, take advantage of economies of scale of your, of your business, consolidate products into one, either ground line haul or an air express line haul, consolidated customs clearing. When these packages get into Canada, then we break them, uh, uh, we break bulk and induct into the different modes in Canada, whether it's Courier Express overnight which caters to a time critical uh, product that's going to hospitals. Out of the US market, we can reach up to 90% of the hospital networks overnight through this consolidated model. We also do ground and packages. We can pick up both freight, the LTL for business to business. We can pick a courier and put them all together, consolidate, and then the LTL network will be put into uh, that network for end delivery. Now, it sounds like that, that's a lot of data that gets to be moved to you. And as we know, in a warehouse, there's so much going on. Jeff, I'd like to pull you in here and talk about how has ProShip deployed something like this and, and how should a good shipping software actually simplify the movement of all this data that Becky and Rosemary's teams or, or any carrier would need going forward? Sure, that's correct, Justin. Uh, international shipping is always the most complicated part um, you know, of a customer's shipping process. Um, it involves you know, customs, uh, brokerage, uh, import of record, non resident importer in some cases. Are they doing a line haul with hub injection? Is there a carrier pickup? Uh, you know, there's a lot to it. Uh, a partner like ProShip can help you automate a lot of those processes, and that's, that's the key there is, is the automation. And whether you're, you're still producing a paper customs documentation or filing electronically, ProShip can work with you to build a solution that leverages our integration expertise and our car carrier partnerships like the one we have with Purelated. Uh, essentially, you know, what I'm talking about is the ability to pull data from our customer's host system and then provide that data electronically in, in, the, in the correct format that the carrier or the broker requires. So if it's in the ERP and the material master, it should be pulled. If it's in the WMS sure. somewhere in there, it should be pulled. If it's in an external system, as long as we can connect to it, it should be pulled. Correct. Excellent, excellent. So going back to Canada here, moving away from the integration items in individually, what can companies do to enter and grow inside the Canadian market? Yeah, so I'll tackle from the, the B2C retail side. So the number one thing that they can do is, is make Canada a priority. For the companies that I've worked with, those that a lot of it has to do with timing, great, but when they make Canada a priority, that's when they've been able to see accelerated growth and true 
you know, ROI on investment in the Canadian market. So by that, I mean from a high level all the way down to the executive level of identifying, you know, growth for Canada is going to be a, a priority for 2021. And these are the matrix that we're going to put behind it, right? We're going to measure year over year growth. We're going to measure investments. We're going to hold different levels of the company accountable to reach those goals. And then in order to do that, that means allocating various resources to be able to do that, right? From the sales side, perhaps putting boots on ground, right? To get out into the marketplace firsthand in Canada to facilitate those that sales and that growth. Um, marketing, investing in marketing dollars and marketing individuals to target end consumers in Canada and reach them in the method they prefer to be reached in with a message to deliver to direct to, uh, to their customer's website. IT resources, for, for us, it is a dedication of IT resources to set up Canada separate from rest of world or domestic US. So really, when a company puts a focus into it and opens up those resources, then we're able to set up a very seamless approach to moving towards Canada um, and expanding and kind of to go along with that as well as how to make themselves most attractive to the Canadian consumer. As Rosemary mentioned before, um, very similar demographics between the U.S. And, and, and Canada. So the overall generality of, you know, target type of customer is pretty similar, though there are some nuances, and it really pays dividends to, to understand and put some energy and focus into this. For example, um, having a .ca site. You know, Canadian consumers will go on a .us, you know, .com U.S. site for sure to purchase things, but having that .ca site and, you know, with the dollar amount translated to CAD really resonates with Canadians. They, um, it makes them feel more identified and kind of special attention given to versus, you know, kind of lumped in with the, with the U.S. one. Companies who are able to do dual language on their websites to add in the French language, which is the primary language in Quebec, that also resonates very well with Canadian consumers. And we've seen customers when they've initiated that their sales increase in Quebec quite substantially just by adding the dual language option. So it's really, again, about understanding the consumer in Canada. And we have all kinds of analytics at PureLater and through our parent company, Canada Post, that we can share with customers to really drill down and understand what that dynamic looks like, what the characteristics are, and, and you know, some advice and guidelines on how to best target them. So those are the things that are really, again, focused resources, uh, prioritization that will enable our customers to see substantial growth in the Canadian market. Rosemary, on the um, B2B side, and if you want to talk about it's a little bit different kind of strategy and growth um, typically that goes into uh, to expanding to the Canadian market. So on the B2B side, a, a few things I'd like to highlight that companies should be aware of or uh, need to know. One, understanding the Canadian market terrain understanding the country and where your customers are, uh, where your locations are. Uh, for instance, I mentioned earlier on about the hospital network. In Canada, there are hospitals everywhere, in the metro areas, in the rural areas, in the beyond point areas. What does that mean? Canada is a huge, uh, vast country, and a majority of the population is in the metro areas. The, the five metro, meta metro areas include Toronto, Montreal, Winnipeg, Calgary, and Richmond, uh, BC. So for a business, if I was a business to business company in the US wanting to service uh, Canada, I would want to know where is the hospitals? Where is a company that I'm, I'm, I'm shipping to? So that if it's in the rural area, I have to make sure that I plan for the time to deliver to those points. If it's going to the, the beyond points, which is a much further out rural area, I need to understand what is the cost of delivery? What are the transit times? How do I manage my customers' expectations to those points? But aside from that, who do I partner with for my product to get there? I partner with a carrier or a service provider that has a a tribal knowledge of uh, the country 
they they can get to the mining areas without any problems they can get they, they in in the metro areas they can get into the different apartments probably they they have access into the uh, apartments or mailboxes they know how to service those areas very well so partnering with the right carrier to manage your business and to grow your business is very important for the b2b uh, segment well, let's let's move on to some of the changes that we've seen. I think many of us who've been in the industry for a while we're used to hearing NAFTA, and recently that has been changed to the USMCA or the Kuzma, depending upon which side of the border you're reading it from. Uh, how have these changes, the USMCA or Kuzma, how have these how have these changes impacted Canadian customers, and and how has that impacted the shippers that are trying to reach those Canadian customers? Yeah, so from a consumer standpoint, Justin, what we have seen as the um, stronger adaptation of consumers to buy a lower price point product than they would have before to, to hit those two de minimis factors. So the shipments that are under 40 CAD have no duties and taxes. Shipments that fall between 4001 and 150 CAD have no duties. So what this has opened up kind of a, a new base of product availability for Canadian consumers that fall underneath that 150 range of products that now are more affordable than having, than before because it's the, the, the total price point, the total cost has gone down significantly on those when you pay, when you waive all duties and then taxes again if it's under 40. So it makes it more attractive to the lower price point items. We're seeing an influx and an increase in sales of those across the border. Again, because of the total landed cost has gone down significantly with the new Kuzma USMCA rules. I think that is one thing from the consumer side that we have seen change. From the shipper side, is the real changes is around how do they change their strategy and go to market strategy on presentation of rates on their website, whether that's adjusting their shipping charges. It's how they present the total landed cost, how they are incorporating the duty and tax information into their rates themselves so that their customers can get a valid view on what that total cost is going to be to ship to them and be able to make those judgments on whether this item that is priced at, you know, $35 is, is worth the total cost to the end consumer. So it's really around looking at that. Do we have the right price point set for shipping? Do Are we identifying and calling out the products that are the, the total shipment cost now that would fall underneath these thresholds and what that means to the consumer? Because um, there's a component of it too, right? It's not at the per SKU level. It's not at the per, per item level that determines the de minimis. It's the total value of the shipment. So companies have also had to make sure they've built into their shopping cart engines and their customer facing web pages to calculate the duties and taxes based upon the total cart value, as opposed to assigning it at the individual SKU level. So for a lot of customers, that was a completely different change that they had to do, right, to make sure they were presenting properly and not losing any business to, to competitors who were presenting properly. So I think that's the biggest change we've seen, a movement towards lower price items and then how companies have had to adjust to present properly and ensure that they are taking advantage of the increased sales and, and consumer demands for, for items into Canada. Lots of information there. Just I, I don't know if any of the listeners are just running through a lot of different thoughts, a lot of different marketing procedures, things of that nature in their head, but I can see how changes need to be made to a lot of e-commerce suites as well as potentially some order management systems and, and things of that nature. So, I, Jeff, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull you back in here again as, as we're talking about all these things with all these changes. How should the shipping software help the customer facilitate all of these new changes that we're seeing in Kuzma USMCA and and of course just just with any regulations that affect shipping execution? Sure. You know, one of the benefits to using a shipping software like ProShip is that there's usually a certified integration with that carrier, uh, which means, you know, in our case, we work very closely with the carriers. So, you know, we make sure we count for any new changes 
that's at the carrier level or, or for customs, like in the case. This uh, doesn't only just cover data and validation, uh, but it also can cover physical documentation as well, uh, commercial invoices, labels, whatever it has to be. As part of the installation process, uh, you with customers, we usually create a data mapping document. This document is very helpful for understanding the data flow between the customer, ProShip, and the carrier. That way in the future, when something happens, making enhancements it can be easier and more smoothly to know where the data is on the customer side and where it needs to go on the carrier side. So using a shipping software like ProShip, you know, not only can we help you automate, uh, but you know, there's also the, the, we also can provide the compliance and the reliability uh, so that when these things do change, your shipping operations will not be impacted. Yeah, minimize that training of uh, the warehouse personnel wherever you can. If we're talking about especially B2C here, but nowadays even more B2B, delivery returns, that delivery experience that we're trying to build for our customers becomes a big deal. Let's dig deeper into the return types that are that are available. And I, and I think one thing that's been a third rail for a lot of us in the shipping software business has been an international return. Becky or Rosemary, is there anything that you guys offer that makes that a little bit easier for a US-centric company that wants to provide that in-Canada feel for that domestic feel inside Canada for their customers, be they business or consumer? Yeah, so I'll tackle from the consumer side, Justin, and then there's some similarities that overlap for sure to the B2B customers and then some that are, are unique on both sides. So for a B2C shipper and an end consumer, returns and flexibility and options for returns is a crucial component that is involved when a consumer decides to make a purchase on a website, what their returns policy is, how easy they make it to return what their options are, is a strong consideration on whether they'll purchase from that website or not. So in generally speaking, most companies, if you ask them, you know, the top three headaches, there is returns, right? How to manage returns, how to handle returns, right? So it's something that has to be addressed for sure. And looking at it both from the shipper standpoint, as well as from the end consumer standpoint, is something that we can bring into that conversation because we understand both sides, right? To try to, to provide the best experience both ways across by trying to maintain cost and control, which is what our shippers are concerned about. So there's a couple of things. Different customers that I work with have different policies around returns. Some make it super simple by, you know, providing returns labels in every outbound box, right? And I know that's an option that ProShip enables as well. So I have some customers who do that, make very returns friendly. Right. I have others who you can get a return, but you have to go through kind of these steps to, to generate a return label and do that. And then I have some customers who don't accept returns at all. Right. That's their policy based upon different reasons. Usually it's price point based upon or um, customization. Right. There's no value to them to get it back that don't allow returns. So we, you definitely have to have a, a, a plan and a partner that can manage those returns for you. And even if you don't allow returns, that's not your policy. It's not something you want to go. Every single company has undeliverables. And those are products that, for whatever reason, can't be delivered at the recipient address and have to go somewhere. So those you absolutely have to have a solution for. And most of our customers tie those two together. So we work with customers who perhaps maybe have their own facility in Canada, and that's where they want these returns and deliverables direct, in which case later can provide that service of movement of goods back across Canada, whether it's uh, through Canada Post or through Courier. So what I just heard you say there, I think is really important. Even though I may be shipping from the United States and I may want to put a return label in or I may need to produce a return label later, I don't have to return that good back to the United States if I don't need to. If I can, if I can send it to a wholesaler in Canada, I can complete that without having to engage with another cross border. Is that correct? Yeah, in fact, that's, yeah, that absolutely does. And that's the preferred way to do it. In fact, if you're shipping something through our pure post solution, which is our Canada post and delivery, it requires that the ship from address be a Canadian address. It's, it's a requirement to move product into Canada. So those deliverables have to go back to somewhere within Canada, right? And so pure later, we have a returns facility. So that's a service that we offer as well. 
with several different options within that returns facility. So we will receive back product again, either undeliverable, customer directed return or shipper directed returns that will come into our facility. And then the shipper has multiple options of what to do with that product once it's there. You mentioned the wholesale house, definitely an option. They could request to consolidate and move back southbound to the U.S. We can facilitate that. They could request to consolidate and move to another facility in Canada. We can manage that. And um, we also have the ability to reship, which is really big on the B2C side. So especially if it's a bad address that sent a product back and our customers, customer services reached out and say, oh, I've moved or it didn't have my apartment number. Here it is. So rather than move that, especially move that back across the border and then back again, which would be extremely costly and time consuming we're able to reship that out of our returns facility so it never leaves Canada and it provides a much better in delivery experience to the consumer. So that's something that we see a lot of customers take advantage of um, that we offer is that reship option. We can also donate. We work with a couple of local charities. So if the product is not valuable enough to bring it back across the border to the U.S., but you would like to do donate, we, we do that or destroy, um, which we have a lot of customers who choose that option as well. So a lot of flexible options. And um, really the best part is understanding from the shipper how they want that product to move and what that price point is, right? That really kind of drives some of that decision. Lower valued goods usually aren't worth the cost to bring it back into the U.S., whereas higher valued goods, and that's where it kind of transcends onto the B2B side with Rosemary, higher valued goods on the consumer side and definitely high value goods on the B2B side those customers in the U.S., they want that product back, right? And they need a partner who can facilitate that and move that product back across the border. Excellent. And Rosemary, sir, I'm assuming a lot of things we just talked <laughs> about on the B2B side are equal on the on the business to business side. But is there anything else we'd want to point out from a business to business standpoint? Uh, absolutely. Becky covered a wide range of uh, aspects that that apply to the B2B segment as well. But just one thing I wanted to add on and to be very clear about our value proposition to uh, companies that do business in Canada. It's four part solution. We do the consolidation, which is a line hole. We touched on that. We customs clear. We do the end delivery, uh, different networks. But most importantly, the returns that we are currently we discussing, which is a closed loop solution. Why is that important to the business to business and B2C, but business to business? Most corporations have one North America distribution center. They want a, a centralized function. They don't want a distribution center in the US and Canada. Most of them do not have a brick and mortar uh, presence in Canada. So we represent that for them. We have the facility that Becky uh, talked about. So you, you can ship, a company can ship into Canada with that returns address as your address. We will handle that project as you well explained and bring it to you very cost effectively through consolidation again. And we consolidate depending on a customer needs. It can be a week a day, two weeks, but we, we're very flexible and it's a very scalable uh, service uh, proposal. And, and let's uh, let's bring this around. We've, we've talked about consumers, we've talked about businesses, we've talked a lot about the experience. Let's talk about software and automation again. It's near and dear to my heart, but um, <laughs> uh, as we look at this customer experience process, we look at the return labels, we look at all the various ways but for a good customer experience, those return labels may need to be produced at time of shipment via an email if a customer service call has been made or, or maybe directly on a website. Jeff, can you talk a little bit about the role of shipping software in facilitating the various ways that returns could occur with a customer? Sure. Like everyone's pointed out, uh, you know, every customer is unique, so the process can, can vary. Some of the most common ones that I've seen are, you know, when the outbound label is produced, return label is also produced at the same time. So, you know, they'll slap the outbound label in the box, they put the return in the pack zip in the box, and it goes on its way. So every shipment has a return label with it. We've seen uh, collating. So they may have a collate document, which is a, a pack slip with some peel and apply stickers at the bottom. Uh, you know, they peel off the outbound label and they put the pack slip with the return label inside the box. There's been automated jobs. We have some customers that have a nightly job where it sends out a ship notification 
every every shipment they dump that day, those customers get return labels. Uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a PNG image that gets attached to an email that gets sent out. We also have jobs where it's more ad hoc, where we have you know where they call in, uh, the customer needs to return something, so they need to create that return label ad hoc. Also, being able to adjust. The uh, return address is also a very important thing for those return labels because, like you said, they may not necessarily always come back to the customer that sent it out. It may go to uh, a returns facility or any other location like that. So it's providing that flexibility is really important to our customers. Excellent, excellent. Let's let's go back to Canada again here. Let's talk about Canada itself. Can we talk about what, what's actually happened over the last couple of years and where we expect to see the Canadian market go. I'm assuming that that a lot of things continue to change just like they do here in the contiguous 48. You've got various market forces going on. Rosemary and Becky, what can you tell us about where Canada has been in the last few years and where we expect to see it go? Yeah, so I'll start on the B to C side. So if we look at the consumer, the COVID effect on consumer behavior in Canada, what we have seen is it's really accelerated the projections by three years of where we thought in Canada the B2C market was going to be. So it sped it up by three years, which is pretty significant, right? And so we're, we're seeing that more and more demand and requests for ordering online and, and shipping to residences, right? As more and more people transition to completely to working from home and, and not being able to go out. So we definitely have seen that. And, and the trends have shown but that doesn't look like it's slowing down, right? So we've jumped ahead three years on the trends on the B2C side. And I think on the B2B side, Rosemary can share some information about some of the key things that she's seen adapt. On the business to business side, it's it's interesting. We call it the Amazon effect. Uh, we're seeing businesses having similar demands, uh, similar visibility demands as, as uh, B2C. With, with the COVID situation, most people working from home, the network has had to change and adjust and have a, a lot more home deliveries, even though it's business to business, but a lot more uh, home deliveries. The, the customers are demanding various options and we've had to change uh, service levels agreements to incorporate uh, that function of uh, home deliveries. But we are also seeing that companies that were already established with an online uh, presence have really thrived during this COVID uh, season because it was easier for them to transition online while the others that did not have an online pre presence, we've seen them accelerate accelerate that or, or build that and now almost <laughs> most companies that we work with have that online presence. The other part is, especially in the automotive or parts, any company that deals with parts distribution, uh, with the disruption in supply chain, there's a need for nearshoring. Most companies are now sourcing the, their product within North America, or they're sourcing the product to real time because they do not have that luxury of keeping inventory. So product comes in, product goes out. And that has really, with the network that we have, the Express, we've been able to assist these companies to expedite delivery of that type of product, critical parts uh, to the end customers. So as you were talking about that, it, it reminded me of something early during the COVID pandemic. And that is that we had a mutual customer that they used your services in Canada. They're a full North American company. As lockdowns hit particular provinces, they actually shifted their shipping from those lockdown provinces to some northern states and used to basically imported things into Canada to keep to keep product rolling, to keep customers happy, to keep them coming back. And and that flexibility, we didn't see a, very many customers do it, but it was uh, when, when it was necessary, it was vital to that company sustaining business. And in many cases, getting ahead of their competitors because they had that flexibility to switch services and still have the same drivers, the same trucks showing up at those consumers' houses now. So that was that was pretty impactful. I don't know if you guys saw more of that during the pandemic than we did, but we uh, did. We did, yeah, Justin. We did. 
supply chain has changed and companies have been uh, forced to be creative. The advantage that we have is we're very flexible. Uh, we work with our customers to to scale up or scale down depending on, on, on where their business is going. We're not rigid. We, 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 we don't have a box that we make them fit into. So yes, we've seen supply chains uh, change and we're here to help them uh, attain that the service they need. You know, there, there's a flip side to that too. You guys are flexible enough to meet the customer's needs. But one of the things that we always look for in a carrier is a clean, clear method of communication electronically. So that, that's always something that, that we look at is that ability to say, okay, we might have added a new service level. We might have added a new types of origins. We might have added some features that, that make B2C or B2B a little bit easier. But the technology and technique by which we communicate is clear and concise. Otherwise, we don't have one method of communication. We have an infinite method of communications. So that's something that I, I definitely want our audience to think about when you're looking at a carrier partner is consistent communication methodologies ensure flexibility going forward. All right. I'd like to go ahead and we've had a great conversation here. I'd like to move to some final advice. And, and I think I'm just going to go down uh, as I see the, the people on my screen here. Rosemary, is there anything else you want to make sure that our listeners hear about the Canadian market, about uh, business to business shipping and about Pure Later? Well, I can go on about pure litter the whole day, but I will say here's my my tips for uh, businesses do, uh, uh, considering setting a footprint in Canada or wanting to do business in Canada. Number one, uh, do your research, understand the market, dual language speaking country, allow for extended transit times, know the market very well. Remember that there's a border between the US and Canada and there's such a thing called customs clearing. So paperwork is, is important to avoid product delays. Keep good records, but also partner with a trusted and knowledgeable company that has a network that can reach your customers in this big, massive, and number one trading partner of the U.S. Excellent. Good stuff there. Becky, let's hear from you. All right. So I think kind of along the same vein is it, it really is critical to find the right partner who one not only takes the time to understand or that does fully understand the Canadian market, but also takes the time to understand your business and your plans and what you're trying to achieve in Canada so that when we put together solutions, we understand the long term goals as well. Right. So we can build and adapt as we go. For us, Pure Later, all we do is Canada. That's it, day in and day out. All I live for is to serve the Canadian market. So that partnership and that knowledge base and education, my, my customers don't have to be complete experts on shipping to Canada. That's my job, right? My job is to, to understand and help educate and you know bring forward new solutions, right? And especially on the, the B2C and the retail side, right? Where we're looking at some pivots, whether it's adding ship from store, ship to store, curbside pickup, fulfilling from multiple DCs, like you talked about, being able to pivot, fulfilling from the US and from Canada simultaneously. How does that work? So it's all of these things, return processing, managing all that. So right, so that's so key is, is finding the right partner that can walk you through all of those various aspects. And, and it, again, most importantly is the end customer experience, right? So within our two group of company networks between Canada Post and Purelater, we deliver 70% of the B2C shipments in Canada. Great. So our customers, your customers, Canadians, are used to that experience and, and seeing our our folks do those deliveries. And they have a high level of comfort when they see, oh, it's pure later student delivery. Okay, good. Canadian company, I'm good, right? I know they're going to find me. I know they know how to deliver to my house at this comfort level, which translates to, you know, more sales and fewer inquiries into customer service, which hopefully allows our customers to expand and therefore our business to expand. And Jeff, if you could talk from the standpoint of shipping software, whether it's shipping to Canada or just international shipping in general, any final advice you've got for our listeners? Yeah, uh, there's one big thing to, to take in account is, you know, a lot of time now specifically, uh, you know, as things have changed, uh, you said more people are working from home, things are being more B2C than B2B. 
you know, there's a lot more shipping volume. So customers, our shippers are, are starting to work with new carriers moving, spreading out, not just going to big three, but moving out to additional carriers to add capacity for shipping. The, the big thing that I can say is, is get their shipping software involved sooner with that communication. So if they're working with a carrier like PureLater, make sure you have your, your software provider as part of that conversation uh, a lot sooner. That way we, you know, they know what your expectations are, what you're trying to do. And, and a lot of times it can help you align with what they have and, and what you're trying to accomplish. All right. Thank you, everybody. Again, thank you to Rosemary, Becky, and Jeff, my guests today. And with that, if you would like to learn more, please visit us at purelater.com or proship.com. You can also see both of us, PureLater and ProShip, exhibiting at the e-commerce summit in August in Nashville. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, just a reminder, you can reach ProShip at sales at proshipinc.com or 800-353-7774. We hope you join us in June for our parcel cast with OpenSky, digging into the advantages of Blue Yonder and supply chain solutions.